Wow. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I know it's uh, the last, uh, last session of the afternoon. And uh, usually, for me, it's the last session of the afternoon. I want to be doing something other than sitting in a session. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that uh, you've all come. Um, uh, this, uh, this session is uh, Containerizing Rails. Uh, my name is Daniel Azuma. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get started. Um, so basically, during this hour, uh, we're going to be talking about container best practices. Uh, we'll talk about how to wrap your Rails application uh, in Docker containers. Uh, we'll talk about how to optimize your containers for size and for performance. Uh, we'll talk about what should and what should not be in your containers. Uh, basically, we'll, we'll talk about uh, how to make your Rails application uh, work well uh, in a container-based uh, production system. Um, we're going to start off with a little bit of background uh, on Docker. I, I'm not going to uh, make assumptions about uh, how much experience you've had with uh, Docker or with Kubernetes or, or related technologies. Uh, so you should be able to follow this uh, even if you don't have a lot of experience. Um, but uh, that said, this is actually not meant to be a first time uh, tutorial. Uh, it's not really a, a first time beginner thing. Uh, I know that, uh, I kind of have to apologize for this. Uh, uh, I know that the uh, program says that there's kind of going to be a walkthrough uh, for de de deploying an application to Kubernetes. And uh, I ended up cutting the walkthrough for time. Um, so, and, and I didn't get a chance to, uh, to update the, uh, uh, the, the program. Um, there are good uh, tutorials on Kubernetes that you can find online. Uh, but what we're going to be uh, focusing on here today uh, is best practices, uh, is tips for making better containers. Uh, so that's pretty much uh, what we'll do. Um, uh, yeah, so let's start off with uh, just a little bit about uh, me, about your speaker. Uh, my name is Daniel Azuma. Uh, I've been developing professionally for about 20 years or so, uh, about 12 of those years have been spent with Ruby and Ruby on Rails. Uh, I I remember going to my first RailsConf in 2007. Uh, is anyone here uh, at RailsConf 2007 or before? A few. OK, that's, that's actually really good. I was, I was uh, hoping to see most of you are, are newer than that, because uh, that really means a, a community that continues to grow and continues to evolve. And so uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that. Um, uh, so, so welcome. Uh, I've, I've been doing a variety of things uh, in Ruby over the past 12 years. Uh, did some geospatial work, um, uh, did a bunch of startups. Uh, currently, uh, I'm part of a little boutique West Coast uh, startup um, uh, at Google. Uh, I'm part of a team uh, that is focused on uh, language, programming language uh, infrastructure. Uh, so we call it languages, optimizations, and libraries. Um, or uh, uh, LOL for short, as you could probably imagine. Um, it's, a, it's a team that, uh, uh, again, f uh, focuses on uh, making, uh, making language infrastructure uh, better, both internally at Google as well as uh, externally for customers, for you people uh, working on uh, Google Cloud. Uh, I'm part of the, uh, the uh, uh, team that handles Ruby and Elixir. Uh, so I, I'm just really excited to, uh, to work on stuff that uh, uh, helps you, uh, you know, people who are using languages that I love. So uh, glad to be here. Um, uh, this is a sponsored talk. Um, and so I do want to thank Google Cloud Platform for enabling me to be here uh, and to share with you about uh, uh, stuff that's uh, some of our ideas on containers uh, and uh, what makes them tick. Um, so. Uh, Let's get started, and uh, we'll get started with some basic concepts, uh, again, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, so first, containers. What is a container? Uh, I think uh, if, uh, if you talk about containers, there's one word uh, that you really should, should come to your mind uh, when containers are, are mentioned, uh, and that is isolation. Uh, containers are about isolation. Uh, in particular, uh, take Docker, for example. A Docker container is basically an isolated file system, slice of the CPU, slice of the memory, uh, network stack, user space, and process space. And again, all of this is isolated. Uh, it's uh, set up 
Uh, so that's, uh, you, it's, it's very controlled how uh, inside the container interacts with outside the container. Uh, now, at first glance, this might look kind of like a virtual machine, right? Like kind of like a VM, uh, but it's not. Uh, this is not a VM. Uh, there's no hypervisor involved here. This is, uh, containers are actually a feature of Linux. Uh, so containers live inside a Linux machine. Uh, they share uh, the, the uh, Linux kernel uh, and the CPU architecture with uh, anything else that's, that's running in Linux. And that includes uh, other processes in Linux, and it includes other containers. So you can run multiple containers on a Linux uh, machine. And again, they are isolated from each other. So really basic on containers. Uh, the next concept that we need to cover is images. Uh, so what is an image? An image is basically a, uh, a template for creating a container. Uh, most of that uh, consists of a file system snapshot. So imagine the files uh, and the directories that you need to start uh, your container. So you know, your application, uh, the, the files that uh, comprise your application, uh, the files that comprise your operating system, any dependencies of your application, uh, all of that lives uh, in the image. In Docker, uh, you create an image using uh, a recipe called a Docker file. Uh, Docker files, uh, this is basically what a simple Docker file might look like for a Rails app. Uh, this is kind of uh, somewhat simplified, so there, there aren't a lot of best practices here. Uh, but it's here so you can kind of see what the different parts are. Uh, the first line here uh, is what's known as the base image. Uh, this is a starting point for a Docker file. It's another Docker image. Uh, so again, it has files and it has, kind of, it has all the information you would need uh, to start a container. Uh, there are different kinds of base images. Uh, this one in particular uh, would refer to the Ruby, uh, the official Ruby image, which includes an operating system uh, and an installation of Ruby. Uh, from that base image, uh, there are commands that you would run in a Docker file. Uh, you, some of those commands do things like copy files uh, into, the, into the image. Uh, so you might copy your Rails application, for example, into the image. You can also run shell commands uh, to do things in the Docker file. For example, you can run bundle install uh, to install your gem dependencies, install your bundle uh, in the image. Uh, you can also set uh, different uh, uh, properties uh, of the image. And so uh, this particular property is the command that is run by default to start a container based on this image. So different parts of a Docker file, and again, they're, uh, they're, they're basically commands uh, that are run in order uh, by Docker when you build uh, an image from this file. Now we're going to start by looking at uh, this first line, uh, the base image. Uh, when you go through a getting started tutorial for Docker, it's, uh, there, there are often uh, some, uh, you'll, you'll be directed to use some specific base image. And there are a variety of those base images. Uh, one example is, as uh, we saw, the uh, official Ruby image. Uh, there are different variants of that image uh, using different, different operating systems, different versions of Ruby. Uh, there are different, uh, there, there are lower level images that just install an operating system for you. So you might have an Alpine uh, Linux image or a Debian or an Ubuntu image. Uh, there are also a variety of third party images, uh, some good ones from Fusion, for example. Uh, I'm not going to advocate for a specific base image here. Uh, each one has kind of its own goals, uh, its own philosophy behind its design. Um, rather, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the things that go into an image, uh, what makes uh, an image effective. Uh, and so these are tips that you can use uh, uh, if you're creating a base image yourself or if you're just creating an application image based on someone else's image. Uh, but that does bring us to our first pro tip here. Uh, which is that it's important to understand what's going on in a base image that you use. Uh, don't treat a base image like a black box. Uh, it's, very, uh, it's very tempting to do that, um, uh, but it's, it's actually very important in order to make effective use of a base image uh, to, uh, uh, to understand what it's doing and why it's doing that. Uh, so 
reads your base image's Docker file. Uh, the uh, Docker files are generally are not that long. It take probably just a few minutes to read. Uh, and most of them are available on GitHub. So uh, take a look at your Docker file. Um, get to know what's, what uh, operating system it installs, how it sets up the environment, and whether that really matches uh, how your application wants to be set up. You can also learn a lot of good Docker practices by reading other people's Docker files. So a uh, good practice, read base images. And as you get familiar with Docker files, uh, you'll notice that uh, there are some uh, properties that a lot of good Docker files have. And one of those, uh, one of the important ones, is size. Size matters a lot uh, with Docker files, uh, with images. Um, they matter uh, in terms of it, at runtime, in terms of how much resources your image uses, uh, your application uses at runtime. Uh, but it also matters at build time and at deployment time because if your image is large, uh, you have to upload and download that uh, to and from your CI system into your uh, production system. Uh, maybe you're, you're building things locally. However you do that, uh, some of these images can be fairly large. Um, and it's good to try to minimize that size. And there are actually a lot of techniques uh, that you'll see out there on how to optimize the size of your image. So let's take a look at a few of those because they're really interesting. Uh, one of the most common things that you'll do in a Docker file is install stuff. Uh, so you have Rails, you're running, uh, you know, you're running Rails. Uh, it'll probably use certain libraries. You'll use maybe libyaml. Uh, you, you might use libxml. Uh, heaven forbid, you might use image magic. Uh, but there are various things that uh, you'll you'll end up using. Uh, if you if you're on Debian or Ubuntu. Uh, the tool that you use to, to install that is apt-get. One thing to know about apt-get is that it does, uh, uh, it's, it's not really designed for uh, Docker files. I mean, it, it's, uh, uh, it's been around for a lot longer than that. And it actually leaves a bunch of files uh, in your file system. It downloads uh, package lists, uh, downloads package archives, uh, certain manifest files. Uh, and so it's important, you know, these files are not necessary for your application at runtime. And so it's, it's a good idea to get rid of them uh, after you're done installing. So oftentimes, when you look at a Docker file, you'll see something that looks like this. Uh, you'll see a, a, a line in the Docker file saying, OK, let's go ahead and, and delete all those temporary files, all those cached files that have to get used. Uh, and this is good. This is important to do. But it's also important to do this correctly. For example, don't do it like this. Uh, don't run, uh, don't, don't update, install, and then clean up in a series of run commands. Instead, do it like this. Uh, combine those, uh, those steps in a single run command. That's very important. And the reason for that is because of how Docker images are represented. A Docker image is represented as a series of layers. Uh, so imagine you have a, a a base image that you use. And then in your Docker file, you have those series of commands. So each major command that you run uh, will add a diff uh, on, top of, uh, on top of those layers. Uh, and so as you run this uh, series of uh, Docker commands, you have this, this series of diffs. And the image is that entire uh, set of, of layers. And so for example, if you run apt get update in, a, in one command in your Docker file, uh, that will download a bunch of uh, uh, package lists from uh, the Debian uh, repositories. Uh, now those are in your image. Those are in that diff, in that layer. Uh, now if you continue to run additional commands, uh, they'll, they'll add additional layers. Uh, later, if you run uh, apt get clean, uh, those will remove those uh, files from, from, additional, from, uh, from that layer. But those files are already part of your image. They were added uh, in an earlier layer, so you actually really haven't gotten, you haven't uh, gained anything here. Uh, the image uh, comprises the entire set of diffs <coughs> from any uh, command that you run in the Docker file. So it's important uh, again to do it like this: uh, get update, uh, install, and clean all in the same run commands, and that 
what that does is it uh, makes sure that those uh, temporary files that get update installs get removed before that layer gets finalized. And so they never appear uh, in the layer. And so you'll see, uh, if you go out to, uh, and, and look for uh, Docker file best practices, this is one of the, the, uh, the key ones that you'll, you'll see a lot. Uh, a lot of people will, will talk about uh, uh, minimizing the number of layers uh, as well, and that's also uh, important. But it's, uh, I, I think it's more critically important to, to understand uh, what's being done uh, in each layer. And, they, and if you install something in a layer, it's there. You know, it's part of your image at that point. It has to be downloaded when you, when, when you install that image. So very important. So next pro tip, uh, again, combine your installations with cleanup. So this is how it works in AppGet. Uh, if you build from source, uh, you, you're, you're installing a new from source, for example, download the source, configure, make, make, install, and then delete your source directory all in the same run command so that the source files which you don't need at runtime don't end up in the layer. Uh, similarly, uh, Alpine Linux. Uh, this is a great distribution, for example, to, to uh, uh, use for Docker files because it's tiny uh, and has a lot of uh, really useful features. One of those is a virtual package feature. It's kind of like a, a the virtual environments in Python. Uh, basically, you can install stuff uh, using APK uh, uh, temporarily. Uh, so install things, use them, and then remove that, uh, uh, that entire environment. Uh, but again, important to do all of that within the same run command so that those temporary packages never show up in the layer. Okay, so again, very important. Combine uh, installations with cleanup. Here's another optimization technique. Some gems uh, come with C extensions. So if you're running Rails, uh, one of the uh, gems that uh, will probably be part of your bundle is Nokogiri. Uh, it has C extensions as part of it. So in order to install that bundle, you need a C compiler. You need a bunch of things. In fact, you need make, you need libraries, you need a whole set of build tools. Uh, to, to install that. Now, these build tools, uh, you need them to install your bundle, but you probably don't need those at runtime. And those build tools are actually pretty large. Uh, I, I, I tried installing uh, the, the Build Essential uh, package on top of Ubuntu uh, last night uh, just to see how big it is. Ubuntu, the Ubuntu bit image by itself is about 100 megabytes. Uh, with Build Essential, uh, it triples that size. Uh, so this is not small. Uh, so it would be nice to be able to be able to install your bundle, but not have these build tools in your final image. Is there a way to do that? Yes, there is. Uh, there's a, a powerful technique uh, that not a lot of people are using yet, uh, but uh, it's, it's very useful for this and kind of a whole class of, of similar uh, problems. And that is multi-stage Docker files. This is a feature that's been around for about a year uh, in Docker. Uh, seems like not a lot of people are using it yet, but you should. You should use this feature. It's really, really useful. Um, the basic idea is like a multi-stage rocket, uh, you have a, uh, an initial stage that kind of does your heavy lifting for you uh, in, in the build process. Uh, and then once you're done with it, you just discard it. Uh, and so only your final stage, which, is much, which can be much smaller, is then used at runtime. So this is how this might look. Uh, this is, again, a uh, kind of an illustrative uh, Docker file. The, there, there are uh, some commands that you would normally find that, aren't, that are kind of missing here. Um, but the idea is that you have multiple images uh, in a Docker file, uh, multiple stages. And it's only that last image uh, that, is, uh, that is finally used at runtime. The earlier images are, are removed. So this is how this will work. So we start with the base image. Uh, I, uh, I call this my base because I'm not sure if this base image actually exists uh, as, as a public image. Uh, so imagine a base image that uh, contains Ruby, uh, but no build tools. Uh, normally, I think the, uh, the official Ruby images do have all the build tools because they expect you're going to install gems. Uh, but uh, that, that image is less useful in production because you don't need those build tools at runtime. So imagine you have a, a base image uh, with Ruby and no build tools. Uh, so you start there, you copy your application into the image, 
Uh, now you need to install your bundle. So let's install those build tools. So you are actually you'll, you'll do your app get update, install, and clean, right? Uh, now we bundle install. So now we've got uh, this, this image, which has Ruby, has your operating system, has your application, has all of your gem dependencies, including those built C extensions, and has, uh, and has all the C compilers and build tools, that 200 megabytes of stuff uh, that you needed to build, but you don't need at runtime. So here's our, our first stage. Then we start over. We start over with a new base image, and then what we can do is we can copy the application directory from that first stage into the second stage. Uh, notice what we did here with the bundle install. We did dash dash deployment. Uh, that, among other things, vendors your gems. That means it installs those gems in your application directory. Uh, in, that includes all of those uh, C libraries that got, that got built. Uh, so when you copy that application directory, it includes your application and all of those installed gems. Uh, so now we've got a new image. That's what we want at runtime. We have uh, a base image with Ruby. We have uh, our application. We have all the gems with all the C extensions, all built and ready, and we have no build tools. And then again, uh, when, you, uh, when you run the stalker file, uh, that first stage just goes away. Uh, so basically, so tip number three, use a separate build stage like this uh, to create smaller runtime images. Really, really uh, useful technique. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the size of your image. Uh, so let's, uh, let's dig into maybe the context of your image. What should go into a, into a Docker image? What should, uh, what should be present in your containers? Uh, I've got a few tips uh, based on my experience uh, with Docker images and Rails apps. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, some of the things that uh, I think aren't, aren't covered enough. Uh, basically things that are often overlooked but I think are still very important. First, encoding. Uh, I remember back in the 2007 when I first started uh, working with Rails, uh, encoding was a big problem. Ran into UTF-8 wasn't as widely used uh, as, as it is now. Uh, we ran into encoding uh, issues uh, all the time, and we we have this uh, very specific checklist uh, that we set up when we deployed things to make sure that things were set up properly. Uh, nowadays, <coughs> Ruby strings have very good encoding support, uh, but uh, the operating system locale setting still uh, has some. Uh, kind of odd effects on the way that Ruby handles encodings. Uh, the, effect, the, the rules are a little bit subtle, um, but in general, if you don't set the locale in your operating system, you don't set the encoding, uh, sometimes you might get Ruby strings that are US ASCII rather than probably what you want is UTF-8. So it's very important in your Docker file to set the operating system encoding that's not already done in your base image. Uh, this is what that might look like uh, approximately in Debian. Um, so, again, next tip. Make sure that locale information is set. Uh, often overlooked uh, still, but still very, very important. <coughs> There's another thing that's uh, often uh, overlooked. Seems obvious maybe when we first look at it, uh, but uh, things, something that uh, we don't often do or we don't often think to do when we're using Docker. Uh, and that's, in production, uh, do we run as root? <laughs> Troll. Um, I hope we're not running as root uh, in, in uh, Rails. There's no reason to run Rails as root, and there are, and there are of course, a number of security uh, issues that, uh, that could happen. Uh, but when you're running containers, remember that containers uh, isolate your user space. And so the default user in a container is a super user in that container. So unless you explicitly uh, set the user and set a, an unprivileged user uh, in your container, you are running as root. You are running Rails as root in that container. So it's good practice to create uh, an unprivileged user uh, in your container and use that when you're running Rails. So, Again, next tip, create an unprivileged user. Uh, 
Um, now, you might say, okay, it's, it's, this, this is really necessary. I mean, containers are supposed to be isolated, right? Containers are isolated, the users are isolated. Uh, does it matter if I'm running as a super user in the container? Uh, the answer is generally, actually, yes, it still matters. Uh, and that's because security, uh, the best way to secure your, your systems is really defense in depth. Uh, if you don't need to run as a super user, then don't. Uh, set, up, set up the unprivileged user. Uh, what, just suppose, uh, for example, your, your Rails application gets hacked. Uh, now an intruder might have super user in that container. What could that user do? What could that intruder do? Could they, uh, could they install something nasty in your container uh, and cause your container to do unpleasant things? Worse, could, uh, how, how confident are you that Docker itself uh, will never have a security flaw that could allow a, a super user in the container to get out of that container and get access to the rest of your system? Uh, that would be kind of catastrophic. Uh, so just use an unprivileged user. Uh, it's best to put as many layers uh, of security in front of your application as possible. So, again, often overlooked, uh, but very important. Uh, next, uh, let's move on to entry points and talk about <coughs> something else that's often overlooked. So, if you've used uh, Docker uh, before, you've probably seen uh, these two different forms of, of a command or of an entry point. Right? There's uh, exec form, uh, which is basically a, a string of, of POSIX, uh, a string of, of, of uh, words that form a POSIX command. Uh, then there's shell form, which is a, a single string uh, that gets passed to a shell. Uh, generally, you, probably, you might have heard that uh, it's generally recommended to use exec form. Uh, and yes, there, there's various reasons why this is true. One of the uh, less commonly cited but very important uh, reasons for this uh, has to do with signals. Um, so. When you need to stop a running Docker container, so for example, you, you call Docker stop, uh, or you, uh, you're running Kubernetes, and uh, Kubernetes needs to upgrade your app, uh, or it needs to you know, scale, scale some things, and so it needs to stop and start containers, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to send a signal to the first uh, process, the main process, process ID 1, in your container. So instead of a sig term or a sig int or whatever that signal is. Uh, if you use shell form to start your container, that first process is the shell. That is not your Rails app, it's the shell. And uh, fun fact about shells, they, they by default don't propagate signals uh, into, into things that they start. So what's going to happen here is your Rails application, the, sh the shell is going to receive the same term, but your Rails application is not. And so it's going to continue on its merry way and not know what's, uh, not know what's going to happen. Uh, it's not going to clean up after itself. Uh, eventually, and, and your container is not going to exit. And so eventually, Docker is going to have to, or Kubernetes is going to have to go in uh, and force kill your container. Uh, you don't want to do that. Uh, you want nice, uh, you know, nice cleanup uh, for, for your uh, your processes. Uh, so, very common, often overlooked problem uh, with shell form. So again, our next tip, prefer exec form. If, you, if possible, use exec form. Now, I know that there will be cases when you'll find shell form to be really useful. Maybe you need to do shell substitutions in your Docker file or something like that. If that's the case, uh, there is a workaround. Uh, insert exec uh, in front of your uh, in front of your process. Uh, exec is a bash keyword. Uh, it's a built-in uh, that basically tells bash this this process is part of the main uh, thing that's going on, and so propagates uh, signals into this thing. Uh, so uh, if you need to use exec, uh, another pro tip: uh, prefix your command with. Exact. So if you, if you need to use shell form, prefix your command with exec. Okay. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, starting to, well, I think we have time. 
Uh, one more tip. Um, so Docker increase, it includes this feature called onbuild. On uh, lets you define commands uh, that run when a base image gets used uh, in, in, a, uh, in, in an application image or a, in a kind of a downstream image. Uh, so, for example, you might write a base image that looks like this, uh, and then when the application image builds from this image, uh, these on build these, these two commands uh, get run implicitly uh, immediately, kind of at the beginning. So, seems convenient. Seems kind of like a good idea at the time. Uh, turns out in practice, uh, it's usually not worth it. Um, so, tip number eight: uh, avoid on build. Uh, there are several reasons for this. Uh, first, on build makes some assumptions. Um, uh, it, it basically represents a base image making assumptions uh, about uh, what. Uh, it, What's, what's being done downstream about your application structure, uh, about what it needs to run. Uh, so for example, you're copying the application image uh, or the, the application directory. Where is that directory? Where is that application? Uh, there are assumptions being made here. Uh, so it turns out that uh, onbuild really isn't uh, as useful as, uh, uh, as it might first seem. Uh, another thing, uh, generally uh, for a build process, uh, it really is best to be very explicit and very transparent about what's going on uh, when you build your application. OnBuild basically uh, removes that. So it, it's, it's running things implicitly uh, in your, in your uh, Docker file. Uh, things that are defined by the base image, which is not uh, necessarily part of your application itself, not uh, present in your source code. Uh, so generally, I just recommend just forgetting that OnBuild exists at all. Uh, you don't really need it. So, so far we've covered uh, some tips uh, regarding uh, optimization of size. Uh, we've covered tips uh, regarding what should be in your image. Uh, let's uh, take a step back and take a little bit of a broader view about uh, your application running in production uh, and how those containers should look. Now, your real-world application is probably more complex than just a single rail server. Uh, so you might have uh, you might have background processes, sidekick workers running. Uh, you might have uh, other services. You might have memcache uh, running. You might have multiple uh, replicas of your of your application running. You know, for, for scaling. So, do you run all of that in a single container? Do you split it out into multiple containers? And if you do, how do you do that? There are a lot of uh, interesting questions, interesting architectural questions around this. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to go through uh, all of those, um, but uh, I will touch on a few basics here. So first, uh, remember Docker files are uh, containers sorry, are about isolation. <coughs> containers are about isolation. Uh, this is important for running in production uh, because it enables predictability. Enables predictability. It lets you remove unknowns, uh, and uh, so you can understand the behavior of your application. Uh, predictability uh, is the key to a stable uh, production system. So here's an example. Again, containers isolation. Uh, containers isolate resources like CPU and memory. Uh, you can tell you can tell Docker when it runs a container. Uh, just give it this many cores uh, and this much memory to run. Uh, and that will prevent that container from spinning out of control and taking down the rest of your system. It's very important to do this uh, in production. Uh, always specify those resource constraints. So take advantage of, uh, of, of this feature. Really crucial to maintaining a stable, predictable uh, production system. Similarly, if you use Kubernetes, uh, set those uh, set those resource constraints in your in your configs. Uh, also, very important for Kubernetes because uh, it allows Kubernetes uh, to uh, to do some interesting things like bin packing. Uh, if it knows the size of your containers, uh, it knows how many of those will fit on your on your system. It is able to do that uh, in a smart way. Uh, so, enables one of the really powerful features of your orchestration system. 
Now, some of you might say, well, that's great in practice or in great in theory. Uh, but in practice, uh, occasionally we have containers where it's difficult to, uh, to come up with kind of a static fixed uh, size for that container, a static fixed resource constraints. Uh, if that's the case, uh, what I would say is if you're having trouble coming up with static fixed resource constraints, that's actually a container design smell. That's a sign that maybe your container might be doing too much. Uh, and maybe uh, it would be useful to think about how you can break up that container. Uh, so it's kind of a useful tool uh, to decide what should be in your containers and how you should uh, structure those containers. Here's an example of that. Some app servers like uh, Unicorn uh, let, might let you preform workers, right? And some of them uh, will even do things like uh, auto scale, scale that worker count up or down based on the, uh, based on traffic. Uh, now, again, opinions will kind of differ on things like this, uh, but in my experience, doing this in a container generally is not a great idea. Uh, it's again because it makes the resource usage in that container less predictable. Uh, even if you fix the number of workers uh, and you have copy on write memory, uh, still copy on write memory can be tricky to predict uh, the behavior of that, especially with a language like Ruby where there's so much uh, dynamic stuff going on. Uh, so in general, uh, I recommend not pre-forking uh, in a container. Uh, don't scale up, don't try to scale up inside a container. Just run one worker uh, in a container. It's okay for it to be multi-threaded. That's generally, uh, I found to be okay. Uh, but uh, forking multiple workers uh, tends to make that, uh, those resource constraints a lot more really to handle. So then how do you scale? You go three to four. You scale by adding more containers. So, again, containers are best used now as a unit uh, of scale. Each container should have static, predictable resource constraints. And if you need more resources, just add more containers. It's quite simple. Uh, one more. Uh, logging. It's one of the basic uh, elements of uh, monitoring your application. Uh, by default, Rails logs to a file in the application directory. Don't do this in a container. Uh, it makes it difficult to access your logs because the container is isolated. Uh, you have to log into the container to get access to that. You want that. That's your logs. Uh, uh, maybe additionally, uh, Docker's file system, again, is designed for layering. Uh, it's not designed for high throughput data. So if you have uh, big logs, uh, you might run into some resource trouble. Uh, so instead, direct your logs outside uh, the container. And there are various ways to do this. Some of the easiest is just to write the standard out. That will let Docker or Kubernetes uh, handle your logs for you uh, and uh, give you those uh, through their APIs. Uh, one of the easiest ways to do that is just to set this environment variable. And that tells Rails by default to get in production. Uh, to write logs to standard out. Uh, you can, of course, opt for a more uh, sophisticated solution if you have a, a, a logging agent like FluidD. Uh, go ahead and use that. Uh, again, it's probably a good idea to run that in another container. So, again, however you do it, uh, make your logs useful by directing them outside your application container. Okay, so we've covered a bunch of tips. I uh, hope you've uh, learned a few things. Uh, if you didn't catch all of those, I saw some of you uh, uh, trying to snapshot a lot of these. Uh, I will post uh, all these tips along with the slides uh, and along with some links and examples uh, here uh, at this, uh, uh, this URL. It's not up yet, uh, but it will be by the end of the day. So this is the slide to, uh, to snapshot your book. Okay. okay, so again, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, this is great. Uh, again, I'm part of the Google Cloud Platform, and we have a boost down in the uh, uh, down in the exhibit hall. Uh, 
if you're interested in talking uh, about containers, about Kubernetes, Docker, uh, or about said, uh, we have a lot of fun things uh, that we're doing with Google Cloud, machine learning, and, uh, and various hosting uh, options. Uh, I'll be there uh, at the booth for most of uh, tomorrow, and we have a whole team of uh, my colleagues uh, who are there to, to answer the questions. So come down and hang out. Thank you very much.